Good morning, everybody. I understand that many of you are actually sitting here in the middle of your own home, home nights. So I hope you can keep awake. Um, I will try my very best to, to be as entertaining as one can be when you talk about physiology. But who of you would agree with me that if you see all these words, that they seem a bit Greek? Are there any Greek speakers in the audience? Now, if this seems Greek to you, it's because it actually is Greek to some extent with some Latin in between. And my hope is that after this session, at the end of the session this morning, you would be able to do three things. One, understand iron physiology and hopefully be able to have the bigger picture and never ever forget it again, even if you're not reading it. It's a tall order. That's aim number one. The second aim is going to be to clarify terminology about all the different definitions of tests, all these things that you see here, and how the different tests fit into de defining and diagnosing different iron deficiency-related states. And the third part, which is going to be a short part, but more as a bridge to my colleagues, is to say a few words about major groups of iron therapies and where they fit into this whole story. Because when I tell my story, you may say, but why do you go into all this detail? It's so that at the end, hopefully, you will all smile and not be asleep. So I'm going to watch you. Okay, so <clears throat> the story begins and I'm going to first give you an overview of where we are. So on the left, the green there is the gastrointestinal system because that's where normal people get their iron in. The circulation which is the red circular pathway there, so, uh, representing the bloodstream where iron will be transported. The bone marrow on the side, which is the factory of blood. The spleen at the bottom and the liver. And each one we're going to go through step by step. Now to make this as easy as possible, I'm first going to give you a bird's eye view, a broad, like standing far away and looking at all the major steps. <clears throat> then we're going to zoom in on the area where iron is absorbed and iron metabolism is regulated. And then we'll relax a little bit again and speak about definitions and terminology and try to bring it all together. Comfortable with the plan? Right. So all of us, on a daily basis, take iron in, in the form of meat, if you eat meat, or vegetables and plant-type foods, and we divide those into organic and inorganic iron sources. So the organic would be especially heme, as in hemoglobin, which you find in meat, poultry, fish, and then the inorganic sources. Inorganic, which is in plants. And all of us take up about 10 to 20 milligrams of iron per day. The challenge is that of the 10 to 20 milligrams, only about one to two milligrams will be absorbed, only 10%. So you can already see that there's a big limitation on the amount that can be taken out of the food at the level here. And this level is the small bowel, the duodenum mainly, a little bit eunum as well, but let's Think about that as the duodenum. And these cells here are the enterocytes 
or the duodenal cells. And if these little dots represent iron, they now have to cross this barrier to get into the bloodstream because the order was placed in the bone marrow. The bone marrow is placed in order for, he for iron so that it can make more hemoglobin. Now to get it from here to there, it first, first needs to get through this part. Now on its way through, some of this iron will stay inside the duodenal cells. And remember that bit. I want you to make a note of this for the end because that is actually going to be important. When it gets into the bloodstream, it has to be carried around. Why? And this is a key sentence. Free iron is very toxic. Iron never walks alone. If you have a terrorist and you know about him, you don't let them walk down the street. You connect them up to something and somebody and you take them along. Free iron is toxic, cannot be left to its own devices. It's going to be problems. So in the bloodstream, you've got a molecule with a very easy name, transferrin. Trans, transport, ferrin, iron. So the transporter of iron. So the iron will be carried, and you'll see here that each, each transferrin molecule has got two seats. You can think of it as a little two-seater canoe kayak. What do, they, what do you have in Vietnam and the Amazon River? Do you call it canoe, kayak? Canoe. Canoe. That's a new word for me. I like it. So you've got a two-seater canoe, okay, on the big Amazon River. We, we've got people from Vietnam here. Do you have rivers in Vietnam? Give me a name. The, 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 the river? The Red River. I like it because this is the Red River. Okay? <coughs> this, is, this, this is not political. This is blood. I'm a hematologist. Okay? So that's the Red River where we have our canoas. And every canoe has got two seats. So how many irons can, can, can be on the canoe? Nothing or one or two. That's the options. Okay. So the transferrin will now, try, will now take the iron safely to the liver in the bone marrow. Now, if you remember medical school, when red blood cells are produced, they ju don't just pop out as red blood cells. It starts with precursor cells that then develop through a number of steps and eventually... Where are the obstetric obstetricians and gynecologists in the audience? Yes? So in the bone marrow, there's also a birthing process where the precursor cells give birth to the nucleus and they push the nucleus out. So they push three times, nucleus is out. And now you only have a cell with hemoglobin. No nucleus, and that is the adult red blood cell. The red blood cell, when ready, obviously contains now hemoglobin. The heme in hemoglobin binds the iron so that oxygen can connect to the iron and the oxygen can be delivered wherever it is required in the body. So the red cells will now go into the circulation. Now, in real life, the red cells are much bigger than the transferrin, but this is for illustration purposes. So the red cells are now, now going around and around to carry oxygen. But iron is not only used 
in the bone marrow. It's used in every cell of the body. So I'm going to stand here in the middle with my arms up to say, do not ever forget that you can have all the symptoms of iron deficiency anemia in patients who are not anemic, not anemic, but who are iron deficient. Why? Because there will be a hundred hungry enzymes, a hundred hungry enzymes that have no iron to work. So they're all sitting there like little floppy flowers. They can't do their job. You won't have iron for myoglobin, which is an important cellular reservoir for oxygen. If you don't have these things, you can be just as tired and you can also feel dizzy and irritable and all the other things related to iron deficiency. And it's one of the things I don't think we emphasize enough in medical school. We teach the students when you, are, when you have iron deficiency anemia, you have all these long lists of symptoms. We don't tell them that if a poor person is iron deficient, but the hemoglobin is fine, they can still feel very tired. So that's message number one. Iron deficiency, and I see it all the time. The doctors send patients to me, they line up down the street to Table Mountain. I don't know what's wrong with this patient. Yes, they're iron deficient, but they don't have anemia. But they're so tired and they're so terrible. They must have some other disease. You treat them with iron and they're all sorted. Okay, so now the red cells go round and round. How long does a red blood cell live? Yes, this is the one question every medical student in the world, except on Antarctica, knows. A red blood cell lives 120 days. Why? How does the body know, know 120 days, you're out? <laughs> it's like, come around one day, two days, three days, you're almost dead now, 117 days. Do you know how? It's such an awesome system. In the spleen, okay, just here, You've got the testing ground where blood, red blood cells are tested all the time. They put through all sorts of uh, motions. They have to get through little slits, much smaller than their size. So if you take, let's say, that's a little hole in the spleen, and here is the red blood cell. This red blood cell gets to the spleen, and he, gets, he has to get through that hole, okay? So now he's like looking at this hole, and he knows if he can't get through it, he's dead, okay? So what is he going to do? He's going to change his shape, then put the one foot in, other foot out, do this, go in underneath, out. <laughs> I, survived, I survived this round. But as time goes along, Red cells get damaged, and little bits and pieces are bitten out of the red blood cell. Macrophage comes in. <whistles> oh, sorry, I didn't mean it was, I, I meant to bite the other one. And at the end of the day, they become less flexible. It's like old age. More, f more stiff, and they're like whole, and they can't do it. And then they get stuck in the, m in the, in the spleen, and then the macrophage said, sorry, time to recycle you, okay? It's a good thing we don't have a system like that. So the red cell is now eaten up by the macrophage. Macrophage, it's like Big Mac, McDonald's, you know? Macro, big, phage, eater. 
big eater. He sits there with a big mouth like a crocodile. Alligator. What do you call them in uh, alligator next to the can canoe? <coughs> And the alligator comes and he eats all these red blood cells up. And the red cells are then broken down into all its pieces. The heme is taken out of the hemoglobin. The iron is taken out of the heme. And then that iron can go back into the circulation. So it can be recirculated. Some of the iron can stay like here, in the macrophage, be stored there, and the rest will go back, jump on the canoe in the Red River, and continue the road around. Now, the body knows the data that we just saw, that iron deficiency is very common. So it's not going to get rid of any extra iron. If it's got extra it's going to put it in storage. It's like in the kitchen, you know. Who of you in your kitchen has a little pantry where you put the stuff that you may need every day? Okay? So the same with iron. Any extra iron will be stored in the liver, mainly. It can be in the f macrophages and other places as well, but especially in the liver. And I'm going to draw it big obviously very small but these molecules are called ferritin right that is the area for storage and the iron is sitting inside the ferritin why because what is our main sentence free iron is toxic we can't let the iron just sit there on the shelf it's very dangerous. A little child may come and eat it. You have to put it in a tin. Make sure it's covered. That's ferritin. It's in the box, in the tin. So this is where iron is stored. And if you, are, if you stop taking in enough iron, or you start losing blood, the body will go to the pantry and say, don't worry, I've got some. And it will use it and use it and use it. But when it's done... Then, the bone marrow will be hungry. It's like, eh. I, what, what must I do now with iron deficiency? It comes and complains to the politicians, you know. What do you think? How do you, how do you think I must run this hospital without money? The bone marrow comes and says, how do you think I must make blood without iron? And it sits there and it says, uh, what's the English word for um, when you stop working? When the union strike. I'm going on strike. No more red blood cells until you give me iron. And then the red blood cells drop and the hemoglobin will go down. Initially, the red cells will just be smaller. So the mean cell volume will also decrease. So, okay, we'll still make lots of red cells, but we'll make them smaller. Why are they smaller? Each one gets a little bit of hemoglobin. We just have to distribute it fairly. Everybody gets a bit. So the cells will not be as big. But eventually the hemoglobin will go down. And in iron deficiency, therefore, let's see if we can do that here. So in iron deficiency, you will expect the ferritin to be low. Okay, because when you're deficient, it means you don't have any stores left. If you have iron deficiency anemia, the hemoglobin, the ferritin will be low, and the hemoglobin will be low. Yeah, the hemoglobin can still be normal. All right, we'll, con we'll come back to this slide later. So let's quickly recap and see what we've said so far. We said iron intake is important, heme or inorganic. Heme is the best source because 30% of the heme will be absorbed. Only 10% of the inorganic will be absorbed. 
Okay, but we're only getting in one to two of that and ten to fifteen of that, plus minus, so ten to twenty in total, more or less. So thirty percent of one to two is still a little, little bit. So eventually, there's one to two that will be absorbed. So there's intake step one, intake. There's absorption. There is transport, which we spoke about. There's use. There's recycling. And there is storage. So now you can all take a deep breath. Now you've got an overview of iron metabolism. Does that make sense so far? Can we go deeper? Are you ready for a little bit deeper? Okay, good. So now we're going to zoom in on this area here. There's maybe one more thing I need to tell you before we go on. Why did I emphasize that there are little, th that iron is also stored in the enterocyte? Because how does the body get rid of iron? Is there a, a button that you can press to say, release more iron now? No. There's no control over iron loss. The only way, well, the main way that the body loses iron is through these cells that are released from the wall and, and recycled as well. So that little cell is changed every number of days with a new one. But the one that is released has got some iron inside of it. And in that way, you lose that plus a bit in the sweat and the skin on the same basis. You le lose a, a, about one milligrams per day. But you will ask, but I'm taking in one to two and I'm losing one. How does that work? So in females, they also have menstruation. So they lose, on average, in patients with normal menstruation, another one milligram per day. So males will lose about one. Females will lose about two. So you can almost say males absorb about one, females absorb about two to be in balance. But you can see that the balance is fragile. Because if a, f if a female now has menorrhagia, then there's a problem. One to two coming out, three, four, five going out, problem. Okay. What about pregnancy? Let's... Now I must try my very best, yeah. I'm a hematologist, remember. Okay. It must be a beautiful baby. Okay. Okay, no, that's not quite right. It's actually there. I must stay a hematologist, I think. Okay. All right. Okay, so what happens in pregnancy? Now think about this. In pregnancy, you're going to need an extra 90 milligrams for the placenta, 450 for the mother, 270 for the baby, 200 that you will lose at birth, breastfeeding, you need another 1 milligrams per day, let's say you breastfeed for six months, 180. Count all that up. Where do you get to? Like 1,400 milligrams for one pregnancy. That's expensive in iron terms. How long is it going to take? Two years of absorption. Okay, you save a bit by not menstruating through that period, but that's like, how much is that? So you're still going to be behind at least a thousand milligrams. So you're going to 
need an extra thousand. So think about that when you listen to the talk by Dr. Arpe, Prof. Arpe. Now, let's go and zoom in on iron absorption and very importantly, how iron metabolism is controlled. So, iron is taken up in the form of Fe3+. Plus. Hmm. There we go. And you'll soon understand why this chemistry was actually important in medical school, because at the time, it wasn't very clear to me. I don't know about you, okay? So iron comes in into your food as Fe3+, plus, but the molecule on the surface here that needs to take the iron in is called DMT1. Now, I'm not saying that to impress you, but there's one word that you, I want you to hear. It says di, 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 divalent metal transporter one. Why di? Because di is two. So this transporter can only take iron in in the two plus form. That's why it's called the MT1. So the food the iron comes in in Fe3+, plus, but cannot be absorbed. It will go right through. So it has to be changed into that, and it happens through a molecule that's sitting here with the long name of duodenal cytochrome B, and I'm just saying that if you hear it, D site B, but an easier name is ferric, ferric reductase. I don't know if you remember from medical school, we used to have this thing called oil rig. Oxidation is loss of an electron. Oil. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Oil rig. Have you all heard that, oil rig? Yes? So, reductase means, reductase, oil rig, is gain of an electron. So if I add an electron to this one, it will be less positive. So it goes from 3 plus to 2 plus because I've added an electron. That's why it's reductase. Now the Fe2 plus comes in to the cell. And now it lies there. But Fe2 plus is the toxic form of iron. This is the one that cannot be allowed to be free. So when it comes in the cells, it says, like, okay, toxic iron, toxic iron, we've got to do something. And it quickly binds it a little bit with whatever it has, any proteins lying around it. So just try to keep it calm, okay? So until the, the big guys come to sort it out. And that becomes part of what we call LIP, or labile iron pool. Who of you would agree that a terrorist is a labile person? You don't know quite what to expect. It's labile, okay? Why is it labile? Because this can generate reactive oxygen species. What does that mean? It means they're setting fire to everything. It damages everything. The nucleus, DNA, lipids, proteins. When whatever that iron touches, it hands out electrons, weapons. It gives the weapons to oxygen, to hydroxy, and it, you end up with a lot of cell damage. So it can't stay in that form. But to just keep you in a bit of anticipation, I'm not going to tell you now what happens with it. We're first going to get some heme. So let's say that is heme, I oh, heme there. And in the middle of heme, we've also got our iron. And heme binds to a receptor there. We're not sure what it is, which one. There's a lot of theory. Heme carrier protein 1 or feline leukemic virus, this and that. And we don't know. OK? 
Okay? We're not sure. We think we know. The hymn comes in. Don't worry about it. The important message is when him is inside, that iron from the him will be released and become part of this labile iron pool. So now that iron that is lying there, this little group of terrorists that we now want to contain, three things can happen with it. One, well, obviously four things because it can stay there, but we're not going to allow that. So the one is we can put it in storage. Okay, so we put it in ferritin. And that is where this comes from. The iron that is stored in the duodenal cell that will be removed naturally. That is this part. Or we can use it. So let's say we go to the mitochondrium and we use it for energy production or whatever. Or it can be absorbed. Now, I just want to quickly pause there. How am I doing for time? How many minutes? Another 30. That's awesome. I love a lot of time. You can see I want to do it slowly. I'm a slow doctor, you know? So now, the iron that is in the cell, the third one is we want to get it onto the can the, the canoe. Okay. Now to get it onto the canoe is like going to the airport and going through security. So when you go to security, there's a, like a big metal door. You walk through. Okay, you've been there? And it goes beep, 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 beep. And this is exactly what we have here. We've got a metal door sitting here, and it's got a name, very original, Ferro Porton. And maybe I must do a little advertising break here, just to get back to the terminology. If you look at the na names that we here have here, ferrous, ferric. How do you remember which one is 2 plus and which one is 3 plus? I don't know if you're the same as me, but I forget these things all the time. I have to have some way to remember it. It doesn't stay in here. It's like just that when I get it, it falls out by the next morning, especially if I'm jet lagged. You've got to have a trick. Okay? There is a nice trick to this. Ferric. Does that sound like three or two? Ferry. Three. Okay, good. So you won't forget that one. Now, because we are not native English speakers, most of us, we can work with English a little bit. Do you agree? We can. So ferus. Two. Okay. <laughs> We ca they, they must excuse us because we don't speak English as our first language. Okay. So ferris is 2 plus, ferric is 3 plus. Now let me show you something. You know what is amazing? If, I, if it says ferru, portent, which one is coming through the metal door? Two. The terror roost. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a kangaroo. So you've got the iron door that the ferru has got to get through before it can climb onto the canoe. But who of you would allow a terrorist on an airplane? Now, on the Red River, they don't allow terrorists on the canoes. Nah, no ways. They want three plus. They want, they will ask you, Two plus comes through the door. Transferrin is there. Says, huh, what do you think my name is? My name is Transferrin. Ferrin. Do you hear that? Not Transferrin. 
Ferrin. I only take Ferrin. I only take 3+. plus. I'm not interested in 2+. plus. So, transferrin, 3+, plus. ferritin, 3+. plus. Easy, eh? Beautiful. Okay. So now, there's a guy standing by the door. Have you seen them at the airport? There's a man. His name is Hephaestin. Who of you know Greek mythology? Hephaestin. Who was Hephaestus in Greek mythology? Hephaestus. He was the god of fire and metals. So he is standing by the door, looking at metals, iron. Okay? So he comes along, and he stands there, and he goes, Ha, huh, Feru, please open your bag. What have you got there? Ha! Huh. Where did you get that electron? Please, I don't, I want that. See this, bo this box here? Into the box. Okay, so he says, no, 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 I'm not taking, what do we color the Fe3 plus? So Fe2 plus comes out here, let's just dr draw that Fe2 plus, this is going to be Fe3 plus, transferrin, so he says, give me your weapons, give me that electron, I'm going to put it in a safe place. It leaves the electron there. And ferrin can, or f f the, the ferric can get onto the transferrin. But have you seen at the airport how many people are standing behind that metal door? Only one. There's always two or three. If you go back to the airport, have a look. There's another one, just to be safe. I mean, we're going on the Red River with the canoe. We can't be safe enough. This stuff is toxic. We have to know this. So in the circulation, there's another one. Ceruloplasmin. Okay? And this ceruloplasmin does exactly the same thing. So you've got the iron door and Hephaestus, the first stop. And then once you get through, there's another guy coming says, just open your bag, please. Just make sure you didn't slip anything through, anything that was missed or missed with that machine. Open up. Huh. Chocolates for your grandmother. What else have you got? Ha, huh, a pocket knife. Give it to me. So ceruloplasmin, cerulo referring to rivers and seas. It's running, it's, it's, it's floating in the Red River to check the terrorists and to take the weapon away so that the three plus can go onto the transferrin and everything can go safely to the bone marrow. So what will happen if we did not have ceruloplasmin or if we did not have the system or if we overload the system? We will have a lot of Fe2 plus in the Red River not bound to transferrin. So what do we call that? Another original name? N-T-B-I. Non-transferrin bound iron. Not difficult. Now this stuff, that's like nuclear. Bad news. Because the non-transferrin bound iron is going across membranes, it damages cell membranes, it damages everything. This is now the reactive oxygen species that we talked about. This can just cross cell membranes, get into the cell and start breaking things. Cause mutations actually, amongst others. Now the question is, we said that iron loss cannot be controlled. So what can we control? One thing. Okay, you can control to some extent how much iron you take in, but you can actually only 
control, you can't control, increased iron intake will only give you so much because the body is limited in how it can deal with the food. The big control place is at this door. And if you go to the airport and there's like an evacuation, everybody wants to get to the airport. We've got to get people through quickly. Well, how are we going to do that? We still have to get them through the doors because even though it's an evacuation, we cannot um, allow them to go through unscreened. So we can open more doors. And there is a way the body can do it. And the way is through a molecule called hep, hep sedin. Okay, it's not that difficult because if you look at the name again, hep is for hepatic, hepar. So it is made in the liver. Why sidin? You know the term microbicide, microbicidal. Something that kills microbes is a microbicide. So hepcidin is a small molecule that has got antibacterial activity. So it was long before it was known that it controls iron absorption. It was known to have antimicrobial activity. And I'll, this is such a nice story. I'm going to tell it to you now. So when the body, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the story in reverse. I want you to follow me now. Let's say you get, get an infection. Microbes need iron to live. Okay. So when you get an infection, the body responds by making hepcidin, which can kill the bacteria, yes. But hepcidin is also the master key that regulates iron absorption. So what do you think the body's response is going to be in a case of infection? Is it going to try and decrease the iron in the circulation or increase it? Decrease it because we don't want to give food to the bacteria. Okay, so we've got ferroportin sitting on the duodenal cells. We've also got ferroportin sitting on the macrophages. So when you get an infection, the body will make more hepcidin. The hepcidin will rush to all the doors and lock them. Literally, the ferroportin door will be taken out of the system and degraded by a lysosome. So the hepcidin tags the door, says, destroy, destroy. We're not going to allow any iron in. So in anemia of inflammation, the hepcidin levels will be high and the iron in the circulation will be low. That's why... Uh, where is my... Ah, here we go. So in the old days, we talked about anemia of chronic disease. Now we talk about anemia of inflammation. So serum iron is low in iron deficiency. It's low in iron deficiency anemia, but it's also low in this condition. And that's often where it's difficult. How do we distinguish? Okay. And the reason is the body is hiding the iron. So the, uh, the hepcidin binds to all the iron doors. The iron is stuck. So even in patients who have enough iron in the pantry, they can't use it. Take, for instance, chronic renal failure patients. The kidneys fail. The body is making hepcidin all the time. Now the hepcidin can't get out through the kidneys. Hepcidin goes up. All the iron is locked. 
Now you say, ah, let's give them some erythropoietin. So now I stimulate the bone marrow to make more, more, more. But the bone marrow is saying, you want to make me, you're whipping me here with erythropoietin. Where's my iron? So iron is stuck because the hepcidin is keeping it away. That's why if you give them intravenous iron, the bone marrow is like, ah, thank you very much. I can work again. Anemia of inflammation, same story. As long as the inflammation is there, the iron is stuck. So you've got to either get the inflammation away, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, whatever, sort it out. Or if you can't sort it out, give intravenous iron, bypass the door because no problem. Okay? So hepcidin is the key regulator. If hepcidin is high, the doors are locked, iron absorption is low. If hepcidin is low, doors are open, iron absorption is more. And the bone marrow actually, and we've just very recently discovered it, it's on one of my YouTube videos, the, the, the bone marrow has got a system to let the liver know when it needs more iron, and it secretes a factor called erythroferone that suppresses hepcidin and allows more iron in. Okay. Right, let's take a breath again. Are you comfortable with the story so far? We got it. It's a long talk. You're all happy, smiling. Good. Right. So now, with all this information, we have to quickly work out how to use our tests. Now, to do that, with all this in your head, it should be relatively easy. See if I can make more space here. Yeah, let's do this one. So let's start. You've all used the test called the transferrin saturation. Okay. So what I'd like you to think of is we're going to think of Zurich and Zurich's bus system. Let's just talk about the, we're busy with the airport. So we'll talk about the shuttle between the hotel and the airport. The hotel has got three shuttles, each with 10 seats. That's the hotel's transport system. It's like the canoe with two seats. This is now 10 seats. So let's say we take a drone, we fly over Zurich. We use our GPS to locate the buses one by one and the uh, Look with the camera through the windows. And we see how many people are sitting on the seats. So the first thing is, we've got how many seats have we got here? Three buses, number one, two, and three. Each one has 10 seats, 10, 10, and 10. And now we're looking inside, and we see there's somebody sitting there, 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 there. Okay, so we have 30 seats and 10 people are sitting on those seats. All right. What is the carrying capacity of the hotel's shuttle system? 30. Right. So 30. What do we call that in medical terms? The total iron binding capacity. How many seats are available on the canoas, on the transferrin? That's total iron binding capacity. You count all the transferrins and all the seats by way of principle. Okay? Then we say, how many seats are taken? What is that? That is the number of seats that are filled or saturated. 
Now, if we want to express saturation in a percentage, we can say, okay, 10 out of 30 equals one third of seats are taken. We want a percentage, thank you very much, times 100 over 1 equals 33%. So the shuttles are 33% saturated with passengers. And in terms of hematology or iron, the transference saturation tells us how many seats are filled. We said that some, some canoas will be empty, some will have one seat filled, some will have two seats filled. All the seats filled divided by all the seats available times 100 transferrin saturation. So if a patient becomes very iron deficient, if they're just iron deficient, we'll just take iron out of the stores and we'll have enough people, uh, have enough iron on the seats. So the transferrin saturation can still be okay in iron deficiency, but the ferritin is going to get lower and lower and lower. But when the ferritin is finished, then the seats will become emptier and emptier. The transferrin saturation will go down, and now the patient becomes anemic because the delivery vehicles are empty. It's like bone marrow, open the door, huh, nothing. Okay? Now, well, you give me nothing, I give you nothing. Simple. Okay? So, they, they, I don't know why the people like to confuse us so much with all these terms, but there is, for instance, something called UIBC. And that is the unsaturated iron binding capacity. That refers to all the empty seats. Forget about that. It's not that important. But just if you come across these terms, UIBC refers to the empty seats. Total iron binding capacity, all the seats. Saturation, the filled seats. Okay? So if we go back to this screen here, we can say transferrin saturation in iron deficiency can still be normal. With anemia, it's going to be low. With this, it can be normal or low. And here, because there's inflammation, ferritin can be high because inflammation causes release of ferritin as an acute phase reactant. So that can be high, and that's a false high. Hemoglobin can be normal or low. Right. What is, where does serum iron come in? What is that? Well, let's go back to this one. The serum iron is the 10. That just tells you how many seats are filled. So serum iron divided by iron binding capacity, or you can also translate this into more or less transferrin. How many seats, how many buses filled? That the serum iron refers to the actual number of passengers. That's a 10 year. How many passengers are sitting on the seat? So passengers over capacity times 100 saturation. Right, so we've got all that. So now I'm going to close with my bridge to the next team and say a few words about the different types of iron. Which form of iron is the terrorist? Ferru. Yes. Okay. So the normal one that we that I grew up with, ferrous sulfate. Which form is that? Two plus. Okay. If you give hundred and fifty to two milligrams of ferrous sulfate, how much of that will go to the get into the system? About three milligrams. Very little. Okay? So the ferrous sulfate will get Fe2+, some of which will come through the system here, 
But if you keep on giving that amount, some of it, some of it will now slip in here and increase NTBI. So a big part of the side effects of ferrous ferrous sulfate is the Fe2 plus that causes problems in the gut because the body doesn't like it anywhere. As a matter of fact, when you eat your food, the body will quickly, it takes it in Fe3 plus, any Fe2 plus will be, they will try to control it as far as it can. But if you overload the system, you'll get an, almost like an inflammatory type reaction that you can get sometimes in the gut. So for instance, patients with ulcerative colitis, if you give them iron sulfate, you make things much worse. You can flare their Crohn's or ulcerative colitis in inflammatory bowel disease by giving this type of iron. Iron, IPC, or the iron 3 that we're talking about here, what does that do? So what, if they, what they've done with IPC is they've mimicked the model of ferritin. Ferritin can store 4,500 ions, and it like gives them out nicely. Okay? IPC does the same. You've got this big structure, nicely controlled, and now it hands out the iron in Fe3 plus form because it knows the system is limited. It gives it one by one and goes in and in. And in that way, you've got a controlled release. It does not go across that intercellular pathway. It doesn't slip in in that way. So it's a controlled form of release. Okay. So let's recap and then stop. Iron metabolism starts with intake. The form of iron, absorption, controlled at the door with hepcidin. Transport, transferrin. Use in the factory in the bone marrow. Recycling in the, in the spleen by the macrophages. Storage in the liver in ferritin. And loss through the loss of cells in the gut or menstruation and very much during pregnancy. And then we said that there could be periods of increased requirement. Growth spurts in a child, an adolescent, erythropoietin that we give externally for patients with kidney disease, and obviously, as I said, any form of blood loss. The needs will be more than what you are taking in. Thank you.